But ISPs are being told that the general purpose network should be one in which anyone can communicate anything except for certain things. Um, and anyone that wants to be a pirate has gotten around these sensor blocks. And it's not just, just um, uh, don't, don't allow certain bad websites that have copyright infringing material that ISPs are being told to block. In many jurisdictions, ISPs are being told to block things that are much less ambiguously bad, like child porn, uh, or, or much more, much, the, the ambiguity in their badness is, is, uh, is, is, is much less. Uh, and yet, it's not particularly effective. Even in, in um, Australia, where they just rolled out one of these child porn filters across the nation, the supplier of the child porn filter themselves said, anyone who wants to look at child porn will not be challenged by this in the least. The primary effect of this filter will be to stop you accidentally stumbling on child porn, which is a completely separate problem and not really what Australians were sold on. And really not the thing, when I think of the, the horrors of child porn, which as the father of a three-year-old, I really do think of as horrific, I don't think of the primary horror of child porn being that people sometimes see it by accident. I mean, that's bad, and I sort of prefer in an ideal world that that not happen, but it's not the primary consequence that we're hoping to regulate against. Um, and it's not just the networks themselves, but the endpoints on the networks that are being regulated. For example, uh, Viacom, I, I alluded to this earlier at the start of the talk, Viacom has sued Google uh, over its YouTube service and said that Google has an obligation to ensure that the material that shows up on Google doesn't infringe anyone's copyright, uh, and particularly doesn't infringe Viacom's copyright, and that the current regulatory framework that says if someone's infringed your copyright on the internet, you tell them, and then they're obliged to remove that infringing material, isn't enough. That Google should assume the, 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 um, the, the responsibility of knowing what all the copyrighted works are, and if they see one being attempted to be uploaded to YouTube, they should interdict it before it goes live. And Viacom has argued somewhat straight-facedly that this should be automatable, that somewhere out there in, in the bowels of Google there is an artificial intelligence capable of making these fine-grained distinctions that sometimes require you know, fully impaneled Supreme Courts to really fully appreciate. Um, and, that, and Google just hasn't rolled it out because YouTube, which actually by all accounts loses something like a million dollars a day, uh, is so profitable to them that they would keep such a, an invention under wraps uh, and, and um, not allow it to kind of go out there be, uh, and, and, uh, and, and police YouTube on Viacom's behalf. But you know, more importantly, this is this general principle that anyone who hosts material from the general public should have the obligation to ensure it doesn't violate some law before it goes live would essentially prevent all the things that we do with hosting, right? It would, it would make Twitter disappear because, of course, Twitter couldn't possibly ensure that you know, the billions of tweets that they get don't infringe on anyone's rights, don't, don't infringe on a copyright or commit a, a, a libel or, or, or any of those other things, violate a state secret. Um, certainly no message board could survive under that regime. Uh, no hosting service like YouTube could, but also no hosting service like the university, which allows students to upload their papers, could survive if the only way you could get a paper into the hosting service was to submit it to the university's council first so that they could review it and ensure it didn't infringe on anyone's rights. And if there was any doubt, ask you to remove anything that might infringe. Um, so tellingly, people worried about radio and copyright have come to the same point in their regulatory quest. Uh, they want to design computers from the ground up that have this inbuilt facility uh, to run programs that their users can't control or inspect and that are designed to work even when the user doesn't want them to. So this is basically that the answer that everyone's arrived at is we should have things like digital rights management technology or uh, in other cases um, uh, trusted computing technologies that would monitor, that would run programs that would monitor what was happening in the system and if the wrong thing was happening in the system would intervene and stop it. And that these programs should be able to run in a way that users can't stop uh, that users can't inspect, so in order to subvert them, and that um, should run even when the owner of the computer doesn't believe that it's in their interest for that software to be running. Uh, so for example, in the radio example, um, something that truly prevented you from modifying your radio from doing A into doing B if B is naughty would have to work even if you wanted it not to work, right? It would have to, it would have to happen somewhere in, the, in a redesigned bowel of that computer that uh, was off limits to users, but accessible to some higher authority than the owner of the computer. Um, so there's one important problem with, with those proposals, is that they won't stop things like software-defined radios uh, from causing havoc, 
Unli uh, they only stop the licensed software-defined radios from doing bad things, and building an unlicensed software-defined radio is easy for all those reasons I've enumerated. The components that go into a software-defined radio are commodity electronics, and it's not in the realm of the plausible to believe that we'll figure out a way to regulate all the analog to digital converters and all the digital to analog converters and all the general purpose computers to which we might connect them. For one thing, um, building your own analog to digital converter is a, um, is a high school science fair project, right? So if you can build one of these things as a high school science fair, it's not really plausible to think that no one will be able to make them uh, even after we regulate them. And since the bad things that might arise from software-defined radios being used badly. I mean, as someone who flies a lot, I'd prefer that they not interfere with air traffic frequencies. As someone who's occasionally needed an ambulance, I'd prefer that they not interfere with emergency frequencies. And as someone who sometimes turns on the television, I'd prefer them not to interfere with my TV. So since uh, it won't be effective against bad guys, and since it also won't be effective against klutzes, right, people who just get it wrong when they're building one for a good purpose, um, I think that we should agree that, that this actually isn't the right way to keep software-defined radios from making havoc. Likewise, uh, entertainment companies now, de now demand that mobile phone companies, games console companies, and operating system companies design their systems to lock out the user when their movies or music are playing to prevent users from capturing their product uh, back to the hard drive in a form that can be freely copied and, sh and used. And what's important is that they've found a number of willing partners in this quest to restrict the way that general purpose computers work. For example, console companies are all too happy to add a facility that restricts the way that software runs on their, on their platforms because their business model is fundamentally charging companies for the right to ship product that runs on their platform. You know, the, the Xbox business model is to sell an Xbox below what it costs to manufacture and then make up the difference by charging software publishers for the right to put software on the Xbox. So as a, an externality of that business model decision, you already have this capability built in to control what kind of programs can run and what they can do when they're on the, when they're on the platform, and that is, is used and taken advantage of by the entertainment companies as well. Um, mobile phone companies are all too happy to build components of their phone that are off limits to user-modifiable software that users can't touch, and the reason they want to do that is they're all hooked on the subsidy phone model where they, they give you a free phone and then build in several multiples of its cost to the life of your contract and, and reckon on you not being able to leave the contract and go to a competitor with your phone unlocked and, and ready to use on a, on a competitor's network. And then, you know, uh, general purpose computer companies and, and uh, um, uh, PC companies like Apple play all sides of the lockdown game. Uh, they want to stop independent software publishers from selling apps for tablets and phones without a 30% cut going to Apple, and so they lock those so that only Apple-approved software can run on it. Uh, and at the, the same time, they want to lock video and audiobooks and other media to their proprietary software so that if you decide after many years of being an Apple customer that you want to go and be uh, a customer of some uh, alternative ecosystem, that you have to leave your video and audio be audiobooks behind to go there because it's all locked to that platform or to other platforms that have licensed their anti-copying technology. But like the BBC, they've discovered that none of this stuff actually achieves its stated goal. All phones can be unlocked, all contents can be pirated, and all tablets can be jailbroken. Um, but the reluctance to face up to this, the reluctance to kind of look for another way to regulate or another way to, to conduct your commercial affairs um, means that increasingly desperate measures are being taken to put, this, uh, to put this control technology more deeply into our technology. You know, it's sort of like, well, that didn't work. Let's see if, if we do it harder, if it'll work next time. This isn't to say that designing uh, devices to attack their owners isn't without consequences. It's, it's, it's not merely that it doesn't work. It actually has a negative consequence in addition to it. Indeed, once you start calling this what it is, a computer that's designed to betray its owner's interests, it becomes immediately obvious why we shouldn't do it. It doesn't matter if you're a movie pirate, and it doesn't matter if you're a hack radio hacker. All the negative effects of this can come to bear on you. What matters is that applying prior restraint regulation to general purpose PCs and the networks that they use um, mean that, uh, I beg your pardon, I've just lost my train again. That's that beta testing the talk thing. Um, uh, gosh, I really did lose my place here. Um, what matters is that applying prior restraint regulation to general purpose PCs means that devices all around you are increasingly running on hardware that is designed with this facility on, in mind 
and is increasingly running operating systems that are likewise so designed. We are adding the legal and technical infrastructure to arbitrarily prevent code from running on computers or to covertly run software that, on that computer, to eavesdrop on all network communications, to block certain websites and services, and to force websites to remove content from the internet on an ever greater set of nebulously defined pretenses with ever greater penalties for a failure to act. Um, for example, networks are being told that they must interdict uh, um, or not host terrorist communications, indecent material, libelous material, or of course, uh, and most recently in the news, illegally leaked material. As we've seen, none of this is particularly effective at stopping bad or prohibited stuff from happening, but it does provide a set of easy tools for censors and authoritarians.